Hi, audience. It's your Ate Sapphire. Welcome back to Something Scary. Before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that the show is now also available in podcast form on Apple Podcasts. So make sure you subscribe by clicking the link in the description below. Hey, I'm Sapphire. Want to hear something scary? Randall. This chapter is inspired by a true story from Elsie Bannon. I work in a hospital. I won't say which for obvious privacy reasons. The hospital is old, very old. It was built in the early 1800s, first serving as a post office, then abandoned for a while before it was turned into a hospital for veterans in the 1920s. Despite having worked there for about five months, I felt like the rest of the staff was always sort of cold to me. Whenever I'd try to strike up some small talk, they'd smile and walk away. But not everyone is like that. There's another nurse, Cassandra, who I get along with really well. Don't worry about them, they're just cranky from the night shifts, she'd say. Cassandra is really into ghost stories. I'm a Christian, so I didn't believe in any of her tales, but I'd like to listen to them. She was a really good storyteller. She told me about some unbelievable stuff that happened to her as a kid. Yeah, I see spirits all the time. I've sort of gotten used to it. All the time, huh? So even right now? I asked, jokingly. Cassandra paused, then chuckled. She never answered my question. A couple weeks ago, Cassandra and I were working the day shift. Visiting hours had just ended, and I was making my usual rounds, checking on all the patients. I heard muttering behind me. I turned to see some of the staff looking at me, strangely. Seriously, what is their problem with me? I thought to myself, but I ignored them, like I always do. About an hour later, I was notified that a patient had died. I was tasked with delivering the body down to the morgue in the basement. It would be my first time going down there. Cassandra had once told me that the basement was the oldest part of the building, the only part that was never renovated. Be careful down there, she said. I thought she was just trying to scare me. But I had nothing to be afraid of. A police officer would always escort nurses and bodies down to the basement to ensure that the body wasn't disturbed in any way. So the policeman, the dead body, and I stepped into the elevator from the sixth floor. I pressed the button for the basement and we began to descend. We stopped momentarily and began to move again. But when the doors opened, we found ourselves back on the sixth floor. I pressed the button for the basement again and the exact same thing happened. As if the elevator didn't want us to go down there. Are you trying to play a prank? He said accusingly. After countless tries, the elevator continued to act up. So we had no choice but to take the ramp all the way down. Once we reached the basement level, it was very clear how untouched this floor was. The original brick walls remained, with pipes jutting out every few feet. The hanging lights were dirty and flickering. It was definitely cold and creepy down there, but that's just because it was old. We dropped the body off at the morgue and began to walk back up the ramp. I was a few paces ahead of the policeman. Suddenly, I heard him say, Elsie. I stopped and turned to look at him. He just stared at me. What? Didn't you just say my name? I didn't say anything. Oh, maybe it was the pipes or something. We continued walking and I heard my name again. Elsie! Just as I turned around, the policeman screamed in pain as he fell face first onto the floor. I rushed over to him to help him up. Something in the corner of my eye moved and I looked up just in time to see dark, shadowy mass disappear into the wall. I looked at the policeman. He had definitely seen it too. We ran. We ran up to the first floor without stopping. I noticed the policeman was holding the back of his neck in pain, so I asked him if I could take a look. And what I saw? I was so confused. There was a deep, dark bruise forming. He said it felt like somebody punched him really hard in the neck. But I was there. Nothing could have possibly hit him. He went home after that. I walked back up to the sixth floor and Cassandra came up to me. I think she could tell that something was wrong. What happened down there? I couldn't speak. I was still trying to make sense of what just happened. Oh my God, did Randall do something? 
Randall? Who's Randall? Cassandra paused and took a breath. There's something I need to tell you. Ever since you started working here, uh, see, there's this uh, guy, um, and, well, he really seems to like you. You mean someone who works here? What does this have to do with no, anything? Uh, he's not alive. I think he's a veteran. Well, was. But uh, he's not around you all the time, but he follows you around here a lot. So much so that the rest of the staff is scared to come near you. Like he's always putting his arm around you. What? He just seems really protective of you. I think he might have been jealous that you were alone with that policeman down there. I just stared at her. Cass, you know I love your ghost stories, but I don't find this funny. Her expression remained the same. I'm sorry. I never wanted to say anything because I figured he was harmless. But it seems like he's got it bad. And now, more something scary. This story comes from Sebastian about a horrible dream he had about being chased by a demon-like creature. One night, I had this dream. It was a dream stranger and more frightening than any I've ever had before. My dream began in a new place I have never been before. It was a desolate place. Blackened corpses of age-old trees riddled the landscape. Ash fell from the sky like snow draping over the hills in a gray blanket. It seemed as though all life had fled this place. The silence here seemed to press in on you, almost smothering your senses. There was a sudden tension, and the hairs in my arms stood on end. The tension heightened and heightened. It felt like I was being watched. As soon as the tension made me panic, the silence was shattered by a sound as though the sky had been ripped open. It was the guttural howl of some primeval beast that was on the hunt. And somehow I knew, being the only one in this place, that I was the prey. Only one thought emerged in my mind. Run. I somehow knew if it caught me, I wouldn't escape this dream alive. There was a path in front of me. I didn't know where it went, but I knew it would take me away from that sound. I thundered down the path, my feet kicking up swirls of ash with every step. Tree after tree flew by as I sprinted through that skeletal forest. It roared again. I glanced behind me and saw it at the edge of the forest. Its skin was the color of dried blood. Its great wings unfurled behind its serpentine back. Scarlet eyes glared out of black sockets sunk deep in its skull. And then it happened. A snarled root caught my toe and I fell to the floor. I scrambled back to my feet, but it was too late. The creature let out a roar of triumph as it raced towards me, slithering behind the trees like a snake in the grass. My heart pounded in my chest. Ash fell, stinging my eyes and plastering to my clothes. I got up and sped on. In the distance, I started to make out a shape. Possibly a shelter? As I got close, it became more defined. A cave! It wasn't far. The beast roared again, growing ever closer. I dared to look back again. It was so close I could make out the details of its grotesque form. Its face consisted of a long snout with two black pinpricks for nostrils and two hate-filled eyes. Its skin was rough and scaly and its mouth gaped open, displaying hundreds of razor-sharp teeth dripping with venom. It snapped at the air in front of it, as if my head were already within its reach. One hundred feet to the entrance of the cave, I'm almost there. I could hear its wings pounding a drumbeat in the air. Its tail, which tapered off to a knife's edge, thrashed behind it, obliterating trees that got in the way. Now I'm thirty feet away. I could feel its putrid breath scorching the back of my neck. Ten feet away. Something sharp sliced across the back of my calf, sending me tumbling into the cave's entrance. The creature was forced to careen upward. I sat there on the floor for a moment to let my eyes adjust to the darkness and to catch my breath. There were stalagmites clinging to the ceiling, with a light at the back of the cave that seemed to be beckoning me. No sooner had I noticed the light when something massive landed outside the cave, shaking the earth beneath me. All pain forgotten, I leapt to my feet and I sprinted towards the back of the cave. I could hear it coming again. 
I dodged between the stalagmites, weaving my way to the light. I could hear my pursuer crashing through the cave behind me. It was almost upon me. I was so close to the light now, it looked like a window. Pain blossomed across my back and I felt something hot running down my spine. I leapt the last couple of feet and I could hear the air parting for what would be the lethal blow. My foot crossed the threshold and I heard it. Sebastian, the woman greeted me. The man next to her nodded to me. The place was alien, yet somehow familiar, as though lost in my memory. Sunlight streamed through the foliage, covering the ground with a patchwork of light. I could hear a stream bubbling not far off. A bird fluttered overhead, and a squirrel bounced in front of me, scurrying up the nearest tree. I turned left, and everything seemed a little more intense. The sun got brighter, the water seemed closer. I lifted my foot to step forward, and the light became blinding. The stream roared in my ears. I put my foot down and I opened my eyes. I fumbled for my phone, trying to silence that infernal beeping. I let out a sigh. Yet another 5 a.m. morning. I laid there a couple more minutes, staring at the ceiling and contemplating the events of what had been an incredibly strange dream. Eventually, I sat up and prepared myself for the rest of the day. The horrible feeling from the dream lingered, however. That tension that caused my hair to rise. That feeling of being watched. I fear to go out alone at night now. I fear that something is ready to chase me into that cave and force me into that alien world. But next time, I might not make it out alive. Well, we're all glad that you're okay, Sebastian, and we hope you're able to get some sleep. This next nightmare comes from Ari who has had a recurring dream about a woman in white trying to scratch her. It happened more than eight years ago, but I can't really remember the exact date. My family and I were living in this small, cramped two-room apartment. I shared a bedroom with my parents and my younger brother. Occasionally, I would sleep in my parents' bed because it would get hot and stuffy on my bunk bed. One afternoon when I was having a nap with my mom, I felt especially lightheaded like my mind was just ready to turn off and whisk me away to my dreams. It felt so easy, so natural, just close my eyes. When I did, though, it was as if I didn't. I know that sounds weird, but I don't know how to describe it. It was like after falling asleep, I was wide awake and cognizant in my dream. When I realized this, I looked to my left and saw the giant window by my parents' bed. It was a big metal window that, when opened, would allow us to see the people outside knocking on our door. The window was half opened, and for some reason, there was this small red Chinese keychain that was made out of thread hanging on the handle of the window. I picked it up in my hand. It seemed to tingle as the thread brushed across my palm. And then I heard a sound. Footsteps. Someone was nearby. I craned my neck outside the window just to see if anyone was there. And then I saw her. A lady walked to our side of the corridor, dressed in white. Her face was covered by her long, stringy black hair. She then paused in front of the door. Without looking, her arms shot up and then stretched. It sounded like her bones were reshaping as her arm grew longer and longer. With her new height, she started scratching the metal window, making really soft and slow noises. A sense of dread overcame me. I wanted to run away, but my feet carried me out of the house instead. Without realizing it, I hurried down the apartment complex stairs and went to the ground floor where the woman was. My body was moving without my control. I shut my eyes tight as I exited the front door and walked past the woman. As I walked past, the scratching stopped. But so did my feet. I tried to move, but it felt like I was frozen. I opened my eyes to find myself only a couple feet from the lady, her long arm descending now, looking to scratch me with those scraggly nails. I tried with all my might and managed to move again, but I soon realized the apartment complex had become a maze. Every corridor or staircase I took led me in circles, and no matter how much I ran, the lady dressed in white kept reappearing in front of me, reaching out trying to scratch me. The corridors felt like they were growing longer now. Every corner turned, the woman was getting closer and closer until finally I got to the front door again and opened it. The wood door swung open into the darkness. I peered inside my dark apartment, and then a massive claw-like hand would shoot out, and pull me inside. 
And then I would wake up. The very first time I had this dream, I thought it was just some random nightmare. But then I'd have them every other month. Soon, every other week, and eventually every night, the same dream. It was horrible. Until one day, I noticed something hanging outside of our window. A small, thread-like charm. It was the same red Chinese keychain from my dream. As I walked past the big window by my room, I saw scratch marks on the outside of my window. The dream stopped after that. But now I fear whatever was haunting me in my sleep has finally got out into the real world. Thank you, Ari, for sharing your terrifying experience with us. It sounds to me like there was something attached to that keychain, so I hope you got rid of it right away. We've got another story about mysterious figures chasing people, this time from Courtney. My dream began out in front of an abandoned house. I was surrounded by a thick forest. The sky was gloomy and the air was cold. Old rotten boards fell off from the decaying house in front of me, but an ornate stone walkway guided me to the entrance of the home. I walked along the walkway to find a small ticket booth, like one you would see outside of a movie theater. A small, weathered boy sat inside the stall. His name tag was illegible, almost as if it was written in another language entirely. He had bangs under his eyes and a sad look on his face. His sweaty hair flattened amongst his purple outfit, which seemed torn in most areas. But not torn from use. Torn from an attack. Like a large animal had gored him, but only his clothes took the brunt of it. I wanted to ask him why his clothes looked like that, but he spoke before I could. He didn't speak through his mouth, but instead through his mind. Almost like I could hear his words right through my skull. In a dull and unassuming voice, he asked me if I was sure about my decision. Almost subconsciously, I confirmed that I was ready before placing down a piece of paper and lighting a candle. The boy nodded at my candle, almost reassuring me that I'd need it in there. He pulled a nearby lever and the wooden door to the house swung upwards into the ceiling, opening a new portal to darkness. I stepped inside. It smelled like dust and somehow it was even colder inside than out there. A staircase lay in front of me. It creaked merely by me staring at it. I mustered up the courage and climbed up the staircase. Each step sounded out a horrible cry, which almost sounded like painful moans. I tried to not think about it and went up the staircase to the second floor. But soon I heard more moans of pain, like someone was following me up the staircase. I stopped and spun around. A shadowy slender figure stood four steps behind me. Immediately, my candle was extinguished and I started running. I ran right down a curved corridor to try and trick them. I smiled and jumped around corridors until I could find another staircase. Eventually, I did, but as I took the first step, I realized that the figure wasn't outsmarted. He had predicted my escape and stood waiting by the staircase. I fell right into his trap. And then, in a matter of seconds, it rushed up the stairs to envelop me and everything went black. I awoke outside in a forest. My head stung like I fell down somewhere. But as I stood up, I realized this area felt far too familiar. I spun around and realized I was back at the beginning. The same abandoned wooden house squatting in the middle of the trees. With the ornate walkway leading up to the boy, beckoning me for another round. Without realizing it, my body moved itself to enter the house again. I handed over the ticket to the boy, whose demeanor did not change. And then I stepped back inside the dark house. I repeated my steps as before, even daring to climb back up those stairs where the figure chased me. But this time, I took it slowly. Each step, I waited a minute to hear if he was coming. Eventually, I made it all the way and turned around. Nothing. No figure waiting for me. Whatever I did, I did it correctly. As strange as it sounds, now I was giddy with excitement. It felt like some strange twisted game to me in a sense, and I wanted to see how much I could decipher before coming face to face with that figure again. I really didn't want to, but what were the odds he'd return? I wandered a bit more from room to room. Most rooms actually resembled those in my own house, but just in a different time period. I entered a room and saw something that really freaked me out. It was another figure sitting in a rocking chair 
But when I studied it closer, I realized it was my mom. I smiled, noticing a familiar face. But after I entered the room, my mom turned on the light and the door shut behind me. With the bright lights, I could clearly see that this was just the imitation of my mom. I stood in horror as the facade fell and the figure took its shape from the rocking chair. I tried to rush out of the door, but it was locked. I shook the doorknob violently as I heard the footsteps of the figure coming closer. And then I turned around. It stared at me in silence. And then it rushed forward and I woke up. But this time, not outside. I woke up in my own room. A little while later, I came across a video on the Midnight Band game. I didn't see the connection at first. Later on, something made me think of the dream. I saw the similarities. I didn't sleep well after that. If you're unfamiliar with the Midnight Man, it's a game where you invite the Midnight Man into your home to chase you. If you ever do attempt it, and I hope you don't, Be extra careful because you never know what exactly it is that you're inviting in. And our next story from Gina May, I hope I'm saying that right, will show you just what can happen if you let in something unknown. I was a member of the youth club at the time, so I was expected to join, but I didn't. Thank God I didn't. Thank God no one in our class did, considering what my schoolmates went through. Our house was pretty close to the school, and I didn't notice anything wrong during the event. So I was surprised by the news my mom came home with after Mass on Sunday. It's good you didn't go to that youth camp yesterday, she said. I asked why, since it was so strange hearing it from my mom who wanted me to join those kinds of events. A participant got possessed while asleep this morning and was brought to church. I didn't believe it at first, but hey, it's my mom. I didn't ask any more, and I didn't want to think about it. The next morning at school, we were rattled by the class next to us. They were screaming and running outside. Curious, we went to look at what they were running from. I was closest to the exit, so I had a peek before we were ushered back inside by a teacher. Some of the boys were blocking the door, but I saw a girl standing alone in the room, back to the door and facing the room. She was whispering something, but her eyes were asleep as if she was unaware of what she was doing, as if she was sleeping. She spoke in a language we couldn't understand. We all tried to listen in, but the teachers pushed us away and took the girl. No one knew what happened to her or where the teachers took her. However, in the coming weeks, it was all we talked about. We asked the teachers for info, but they said nothing. But slowly, more incidents began to occur. More sleeping students standing upright in the halls and whispering things we couldn't understand. People were getting possessed from all grades and the teachers were telling us nothing. It seemed to happen in our sleep. Even if you dozed off in class, there was a chance you'd stand right up and start acting unlike yourself. At this point, we were terrified, wondering if it would happen to any person in our class. Soon the possessions became more intense. One day, two more possessions happened in the same time block. We ran outside to find two of the girls speaking in that strange language. One of our friends finally told us that the language was Latin. We then stood in horror as one of the girls turned to the other, put her hands around the neck of her friend, and squeezed with all her might. We screamed and rushed forward to pull them apart. We tried so hard, but the girl had an iron grip. And the other girl who was getting strangled, she was just accepting it. It almost looked like she was smiling. Soon, a group of teachers rushed out and managed to pull the girls off of each other. The teachers took the girls away, and we never saw them again. That was the worst part. The sleep possession seemed to happen to anyone. But once they did, there was no cure. We were scared. Until one day, we noticed a pattern. Those that were possessed were participants of the youth camp. Teachers advised us to let the possessed whisper what they wanted and to not touch them. It seemed that interfering with them or trying to wake them up would in turn make them even more violent. Later that day, we learned that we were a total of nine students who were allegedly possessed. Apparently, during the night of the camp, some of the students weren't serious during a prayer ritual and angered the spirits. When the whole camp went to sleep, The angered spirits entered the dreams of the children and would slowly possess them over time, only activating until there were other children around. 
like silent observers waiting for an audience of kids to listen to their Latin sermons. And when they would be interrupted, they would strike back in force. We never saw those nine kids again. They seemed to be taken to a special part of the school where the teachers would work on curing them. Some kids said it worked, and they transferred schools. Others said the teachers ended up just killing the students to stop their whispers. Whatever the outcome, I know one thing. Camp is canceled. Well, that was an absolutely horrifying experience. I have actually heard of something like this happening to a few people that I know. Um, Not exactly the same way, but this experience of being taken over at a religious event is definitely something that is not uncommon. And now we've reached our final story about Kaylee, who was visited by a bullet-ridden monster one night. When I was two years old, we moved from Georgia to the southern part of North Carolina, around the Wilmington area. My mom had just found out she was pregnant with my sister, and the house we lived in with my grandma didn't have enough room for another baby. We moved to an apartment complex, and the place was fine at first, but I have a few memories of the place that don't really make any sense. On top of that, my parents always say I was a rather imaginative child. They said I was a bit of a dreamer with a few imaginary friends that I talked to, though I don't have any memory of that. I have memories of talking to people who were very real, but now that I look back, I realize that when they were around, it was wrong. Like they looked wrong, barely transparent, and they flickered as if I was seeing them out of my peripheral vision, even when I was looking straight at them. I thought that I was dreaming them up, but they seemed real enough. And there was always this feeling in my gut when I talked or played with them as if I shouldn't be. A sense of danger. There were a few incidents where I was pushed or thrown whenever no one was near me except my baby sister or my cat. And I doubt a toddler half my size or a cat could throw me 20 feet. There was a time when I was four or five when I was at the pool in the complex, sitting on the edge of the shallow end, Everything felt normal until suddenly I was thrown into the deep end. Both of my parents, my sister, and few other adults at the pool were either in it or on the opposite side from me. No one was close enough to throw me. There was another time when I was four. My dad was taking a night shift at the jail he worked for and my mom was asleep. But that night I was somehow lifted out of the top bunk of me and my sister's bunk beds and dropped to the floor below. It wasn't a hard drop, almost like I was lifted up and placed gently on the floor. I mean, if I was just dropped, I would have woken up from it, right? But I kept sleeping until morning, only then realizing that I was on the floor. But nothing, nothing of what I saw, heard, or had happened to me compares to that night, a week before we moved here to Kentucky. It was the middle of the night. My parents were asleep in their room on the opposite side of the apartment with their door closed and my door closed. But I heard it anyway. A tap, tap, tapping at the window. I slowly sat up in my bed and turned to face the window. I couldn't see that well because the headboard of my bed was against the wall the window was on, so I had to climb out of the top bunk and walk over to the window to see it. But I stood a couple of steps away from it just in case. The window didn't have a screen, only the glass. And pressed against that glass was two hands and a face. A face I'll never forget. His face was so disfigured, I could no longer tell what he looked like, and it was too dark to make out things like the color of his hair or the color of his skin, though from what I saw, he didn't even have a human skin tone. His hands and his face were gray, as if he'd never seen the sun in a long time, though with all the blood on his hands and face, there was barely enough skin showing. His eyes were completely black, with no other color in them, and there was a sadistic smile on his face as he looked at me. The source of the blood was from three bullet holes in his face and one in his shoulder, one bullet hole in each cheek and one in his forehead. I was scared out of my mind just from seeing the man, but what he said was even worse. The window was cracked open a little bit, enough to let fresh air in, and through it I heard him say, Let me in, little girl. Open the window. I didn't respond. Something in my gut told me not to. And even if it hadn't, I was too afraid to say anything anyways. 
Then he said it again, but differently, more stern, more angry. I said, let me in, little girl, open the window. Again, I didn't respond. The smile vanished from his face, and fresh blood started dripping from the bullet wounds. When he said it this time, his voice was deep, much darker than it had been before. It was so low that it almost sounded like a growl when he said, I said, open the goddamn window. I didn't respond for the third time. Instead of repeating himself again, he started to scream, to curse. I realized with horror that his skin was peeling away, as if he was decaying, but at a much faster rate. The skin and flesh of his face decayed faster and faster until suddenly he was gone. There was no trace of him except for two bloody handprints on the window. I didn't sleep for the rest of that night. I even closed the window the rest of the way, though it was open less than an inch in the first place. I've been paranoid ever since. I keep the curtains closed when I sleep. I have a night light and a few other sources of light in my room that I turn on before I go to sleep. And of course, I have nightmares about it when I do go to sleep. I know it's not healthy. I can't help it anymore, though. I only manage an average of about three hours of sleep a night, though. It's been eight years now, but I can still see his face when I close my eyes and hear those horrible words. Let me in, little girl. Open the window. Ooh, trying to do that demon voice really hurt my throat. Well, Kaylee, I'm glad you didn't open the window for whatever it was that you saw. I hope you're able to get back on a normal sleep schedule soon. Like and share this video if it gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe to Snarled and turn on the bell for notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to the Something Scary Podcast on Apple Podcasts. And if you dare, follow me on social media. Until next time, sweet dreams.